human aspects of our lives, right? We mark time in certain ways, and we, we have traditions. And as we mark time with our families and our loved ones, um, we're kind of forming ourselves to each other, right? And these habits and these ways of living. So the Catechism, again, was talking about the way that um, the church keeps this kind of cycle. It says, from the time of the Mosaic Law, the people of God have, have observed fixed feasts, beginning with Passover, to commemorate the astonishing actions of the Savior God, to give him thanks for them, to perpetuate their remembrance, and then I think this is key, and to teach new generations to conform their conduct to them. Okay? So to teach new generations how to conform their conduct to them. This means as we go through the cycle of, of the liturgy, as we go through the cycle of our own lives, and we, we have these traditions, and we have these celebrations, and we have even the ways that we mourn together, we're forming our habits and our, and our very selves. And so Mother Church gives us a way to form ourselves very particularly to Christ. Um, so I want to get kind of specific in what this looks like, um, a little bit more yeah, practical. And you want to help me pass this out? I'm going to keep one for myself. Um, so what Joe's passing out is um, just a, a kind of an image graphic of what the Catholic liturgical year looks like. Um, because we have a rhythm to the way that we do these things. And I kind of just want to walk through this with you, um, paying special attention to some of the beautiful things that the church does for us um, as she kind of lays out a rhythm to our lives. Um, and maybe talk about some of the ways that I think that we can, we can enter into this um, so that we can, uh, again, be conformed to the ways of Christ. Um, so something to take note of before we go through this is that there's, there's actually kind of two calendars in the Catholic Church. There's the liturgical cycle, um, which we have here, and then there's the, the calendar of our feast days, where we particularly commemorate um, our saints, right? And so those are two, they're, they're different things, um, although they, they become really interwoven in our lives. And um, so what I'm gonna go through first, though, is this liturgical cycle. And we cycle, as, as you might know, we cycle every three years. Um, so for those of you who've been a part of family faith formation for over for three years, you've noticed, <laughs> right, there's a three-year cycle to the way that you're learning things, because three years ago, you learned about this same topic. Um, and the church does this also for us. So it's not just that every year is exactly the same. We actually rotate our readings over a three-year cycle. We rotate um, kind of just particular things that we're, we're paying attention to to help us again, so that it's not mundane, even in the routine. Um, but the Catholic year actually starts not on January 1st. It starts uh, with the season of Advent, which is usually uh, pretty close in, in the American church right after Thanksgiving, right? Um, so the first Sunday of Advent, at Advent, we usually have right about four weeks before Christmas. And I think the season of Advent is one of the most beautiful times in the year um, because it's something unlike <coughs> any other. We're not um, sad, even though we're wearing purple. <laughs> Um, we're not mournful. It's a season of expectation and hope, right? Because we're preparing, first of all, to commemorate the birth of Christ at his nativity. But also, if you listen to the readings, what you'll notice is that they're focusing on an expectation of heaven. So we're reading a lot from the prophet Isaiah, right? Where Isaiah talks about this time when lion and lamb will lay together. And, and now this is is somewhat taking place in the life of, after the time of Christ, but I don't know about you, I don't see many lions and lambs laying together. And so I know that this is a reading that's calling me onto some future that's even more beautiful than the one that, I, that I'm currently in. So Advent is a season where we get to expect and we get to hope and we get to yearn. And, and so we do sometimes enter into to fasts, right? It's not the great fast of the church. It's not a time where we're... Um, giving up meat on all of our, our Fridays, although we're probably doing some sort of penance on Fridays, what we're doing is we're being mindful of the fact that I'm not quite ready for heaven. I'm not quite ready for heaven. And if I want to be more ready for heaven, then maybe this is a time where I should focus on maybe working on a particular virtue or uh, giving up something that has kind of taken the place of God in my life because I'm hopeful for the things to come and I want to better prepare for them. Then we enter into the season of Christmas, which in America lasts approximately 23 hours, because usually by the end of Christmas Day, the trees are down. And I want to challenge you guys to not be that way. <laughs> um, we have the beauty of having a full 12 days of Christmas. Um, 
And, and for some people, actually the Christmas season can last all the way up to February 2nd. And, and the Vatican, they keep their Christmas trees up until February 2nd. Um, so we have this season of really living in the mystery of the birth of Christ. And again, this is what the liturgical calendar is doing for us. It's calling to mind the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Um, so we get to just sit there for a little bit. We get to meditate on the fact that God became man. God became like me, a human being, right? Not only did God become man, but he became a poor man, right? Born in a cave, born below all other human beings of, of a race that was um, one of the lowest thought of, of all races. God became small for my sake, and so I'm going to sit in that, and I'm going to think about that, and I'm going to rejoice in the fact that God loved me enough to do that. Right? He loved me enough to become like me, to become man so that man might be redeemed. Um, so we sit in that, and we rest in that, until we get to the Feast of the Epiphany, which, of course, um, this, uh, this coming to light was, uh, is the feast when the three kings, or the three wise men, uh, visited Christ, and so we have... Christ being made present to the world, not just to Mary and Joseph, not just to the people of Israel, but to all of us, right? Which is something for which we, we ought to, again, just be incredibly grateful for. Um, and then we enter into the season of ordinary time. And um, I think ordinary time's beautiful. I think there's something incredibly life-giving about the mundane and ordinary, right? Like, in my daily life, I love that I have a routine. Now, my routine's been a little bit messed with lately. I don't know um, what's going on in your lives, but like every once in a while, my routine gets a little bit flustered. Um, but I love that I have routine. I love that I know when I go to bed and when I wake up, and I love being at home. <laughs> I'm a homebody through and through. And I love this sense of the ordinary, right? Because it's in the ordinary that miracles happen. It's in the ordinary time when we get to read about the work of Christ that he did on earth, right? The ordinary things that Christ did in his three years of public ministry, where he forgave sins, where he healed the sick, where he preached the gospel, these are ordinary things, right? So we get to enter into the ordinary daily routine of our lives, and we get to learn what God can do with the ordinary, right? So never think that ordinary means blasé. Never think that ordinary means lame or just like not the cool time of year. It's the time when things really happen, when Christ does his most deep work in our hearts. Um, and we have the season of Lent, the great fast of the church. 40 days. 40 days uh, in memory of the 40 days of rain and 40 nights of rain before the ark. 40 days in memory of the 40 years um, that the people of Israel spent on their way to the promised land. 40 days in, in memory of the 40 days of temptation of Christ. So 40 is obviously a number that matters. Um, it's a time of purification. right? It's a time of... Uh, of penance and, and also again of preparation because we're preparing for for the death of Christ. Okay? So the readings um, are going to focus on a lot of different things in this period because we are one in in the time of the church we're preparing for, for the death of Christ. So the readings are going to focus on um, his journey into Jerusalem, his last journey into Jerusalem. But we're also remembering uh, that we are frail <laughs> and that we are weak, and again we're not quite ready for. Um, that there's a lot of work that needs to be done on us. So this is why we, we participate in the three great works of Lent. Do you guys know what they are? Fasting, Fasting prayer, and almsgiving. Because all of these things help us to be more uh, conformed to the person of Christ, right? In fasting, we give up things, sometimes things that we really like, sometimes things that are, we also give up things that we really need, right? Sometimes we fast, um, so that I can remember that my body is, is, uh, is passing, right? Even though it will be resurrected, my body is passing. And so I'm going to kind of mortify myself. I'm going to fast from things that I, I might even need. So that's why some months I've given up, I've given up snacks between meals and eaten smaller meals. And I've actually been a little hungry because it helps me to remember that my body isn't <laughs> like, like making myself feel happy and pleasurable. Like that's not the greatest end. Right? Being hungry isn't a horrible thing. Um, that's why we give money to the poor in a, in a special way, hopefully all the year round. Um, but we give money in alms because we're mindful of the fact, again, that God became poor 
and that the people who are poor have a special place in God's heart, um, and so that we can again kind of give of ourselves in a way that helps us to recognize our own littleness, right? And we also focus on prayer um, so that we can be more unified with the person of Christ. Right? So this is why you'll hear people who are saying, like, I'm going to do this devotion every day during Lent, or I'm going to do 15 minutes of prayer every day during Lent. Um, and honestly, I think adding on to your prayer is one of the best things that you can do during Lent. <laughs> uh, but don't forget that fasting is still important. Giving alms are still important because all of these things help us to recognize um, just kind of the littleness of ourselves. Um, and then we enter into the preeminent season of the church, which is actually only three days. <laughs> and, and I think this is one of the seasons of the church that is, is uh, not often thought about as a season. Um, and this is the, the sacred triduum of the church. So Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Vigil, they're actually, it's a season, the triduum. Um, this is the, the heart of our year. This is the point upon which everything hinges. Right? Even though our year starts in Advent, everything is seen as either preceding these feasts or coming out of them. Because on Holy Thursday, we celebrate, um, first of all, the institution of the Eucharist, but also Christ entering into his passion as he goes to the, to the Garden of Gethsemane, as he enters into his agony, as he prepares to die for us on the cross. On Good Friday, we actually celebrate that death. Right? We commemorate it the one day of the entire year where there's not a mass celebrated in the entire world. Um, because we're recognizing the emptiness of the tomb, and again, we're kind of resting in that. We're sitting with that. But then we get to come out of that on the evening of Saturday um, with the Easter Vigil, right? This beautiful celebration. And if you have, haven't ever had a chance to participate in any of these, these um, liturgies of the Triduum, I highly encourage it. Um, highly recommend doing all three <laughs> if you can. Um, and I know that kids sometimes make that really hard, <laughs> particularly the, the Easter Vigil, it's late. Um, but if you really want to understand what it means to, um, to celebrate the Mass in, in a way that you can actually understand the Paschal mystery, this is the best way to do it. To enter into these very unique liturgies and to see the points upon which our whole faith hinges. Um, and then we get the beauty of 50 days of Easter. So if you think 40 days of fasting are hard, praise God, we have 50 days of fasting. <laughs> uh, so the, the Easter season is, is one of the longest seasons other than ordinary time. It is the longest season. Because again, we're celebrating the resurrection of Christ, the high point of our faith, right? That not only did Christ die on a cross for us, not only did he suffer death for us, um, but he was resurrected and he ascended into heaven so that we could have hope in the resurrection of our own lives. And so that we know that he did, was not overcome by death, right? God was not overcome by death. In fact, he destroyed it. Um, and then we enter back into the season of ordinary time that we're in. Again, the ordinary where the miracles happen. So um, I want to, yeah, just kind of think for a couple minutes about, about how we can enter into the celebration of the liturgical seasons. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's not just about um, the fasting or or. Like, okay, well, I can eat chocolate today because it's Easter, and then we, we kind of gorge ourselves on chocolate for the, at least the first week of Easter. Listen, I've been there. Uh, I remember the year I gave up cheese, and I had so much cheese on Easter Sunday. You guys, like, it was wonderful. <laughs> uh, but, like, how do we actually celebrate the seasons of the year so that we are being conformed to the person of Christ? Right? Why do we do the things we do? Why do I, I will say this, I do make a rule of eating bacon during, during Easter because um, we couldn't have bacon before the resurrection. So I think it's really important to my faith um, <laughs> that I eat bacon during this time. But, <laughs> but why are we doing this? It's because I want to be more conformed to Christ, right? And this is particularly in your families. What are we doing with our kids so that they're actually being more formed to the person of Christ? Listen, I think it's very simple. Um, how do we celebrate anything, right? How do we celebrate weddings? We go to Mass, first of all. We enter into the celebration of the sacred liturgy, and then we feast, and we celebrate, and we spend time with our friends, and we spend time with our families, right? That's how we feast. This is how we celebrate. How do we mourn, right? How do we mourn um, the death of someone in a family or, or a loved one? Um, 
we cry and we weep and, and we don't eat as much and we don't sleep as much, but then at some point it turns into its own celebration of their life. I think of the times when my extended family has lost someone and my, my family came together and uh, even in the midst of the sorrow, there was great joy, right? A great hope that was present in our families. So how we, again, how we do life normally is how we enter into the liturgical seasons of the year. We sing songs. So I, my three-year-old niece is living with me right now, and um, she has no sense. <laughs> she, she hasn't gone to a Catholic church until, except for when she's with me. Um, she does think the priest is Jesus, because whenever I point at the Eucharist, she thinks I'm pointing at the, at, at the priest. So there's a little bit of confusion there. But I found that I can do things to help her to enter into the life of Christ. Right? Sometimes it's the songs I sing. Um, so I, every night I sing her a Marian hymn that is, is appropriate to the season that we're in. She doesn't know what I'm saying, she doesn't understand, but she will notice that the song changes, right? And she will notice that, that, that I'm praying and I'm teaching her about the life of Christ and the person of Mary. It's, yes, go ahead. So I was just wondering, I know some of the church's calendar like came out of, um, oh, you know, other religions' important days. So, because I'm thinking, you know, like, I mean, even when you talked about Christmas and how it's only 23 hours long, really for most people it begins Black Friday. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, is it possible to, I don't know, you know, almost like, that was really the point of the early church is they, they took things that people already knew in the mm -hmm. culture and then they used them for the faith. Yeah. Because it, it just seems like more and more like, our stuff's being hijacked, changed, and then people actually mark the time by the hijacked change. Yeah. So I don't know how you take it back, back or <laughs> put something there, you know, that makes it significant to the faith and not just. I think Advent's actually probably the easiest one to do this with because. Uh, Christmas has begun Black Friday, but actually what the secular world is doing is preparing for Christmas. And they just don't celebrate it as long as we do. <laughs> um, but what they're doing is they're shopping. Like, I, it, it has a little bit to do with mindset and um, the sense that the Catholic Church baptizes what is popular in the world, right? So like to take it back essentially means we can do what they're doing. We can shop for gifts. You can, you can decorate your tree before Christmas because you're preparing for Christmas, right? You're preparing for the celebration, but we're doing it with this intention of, of entering into the celebration, right? I mean, I have, I have friends who <laughs> like have made lists of like all the Christmas songs that are out in Advent that you can listen to because they're actually about winter time or like preparing. Like it's the most wonderful time of the year. It is the most wonderful time of the year. That's not a Christmas song, that's an Advent song. Oh. <laughs> so there is a sense I think of entering into like how am I approaching this time? I'm not approaching the season of Advent as I'm already in the celebration. It's all, I'm all preparing for the celebration, right? I'm preparing for, for the great feast of the church. Um, I think it's harder with some of our other feasts. Um, I think Easter is probably one of the ones that's probably a little bit more challenging. Um, I think like Halloween, you know, yeah. or something like that, where it's like, like kids are thinking mm -hmm. now, I mean, have been already. What are they going to be for Halloween? Yeah, my three-year-old. No idea what Halloween even is. Yeah, my niece can't wait for Pumpkin Day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> she thinks that she thinks it's the greatest thing in the world, and that's because yeah, she just keeps seeing pumpkins popping up everywhere, um, and she can't wait to go to the pumpkin patch. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think there is a sense of, of like recognizing, um, like it's okay to enter into some of the celebrations of the year. But to know that they aren't the fullness of the celebration. Like All Hallows' Eve, right? It's the vigil of the Feast of All Saints. And we ought to celebrate All Saints bigger than we do Halloween. Right? We ought to celebrate our saints with more fervor and vigor than we do getting candy the night before. Yeah. So I did that one year. I dressed up as uh, uh, St. Damien of Malachi. And kids thought I was a zombie because he, uh, he had <laughs> But then I, I put a saint card on each piece of candy. Mm -hmm. And what blew me away is I would stand there, I would hand these, you know, and the kids would literally pull the holy card off mm -hmm. and put the candy in their basket. And again, it was just, they had no idea. Mm -hmm. You know, and so they, it's almost like, how do you, 
not get a little bit discouraged by the fact that the calendar really has been hijacked and how do you take it back? I mean, how do you, I don't know. I mean, you don't have to answer that. It's just No, I think that's an important question. I think, um, go ahead. Well, I think it begins in the family. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about taking this back, but everything that happens in our faith, these cycles, we talked, started about in, in what we do for our Christmas celebrations and our families. It comes back to that routine and that direction and that intention that we have to have within our own families apart from the secular world. We can't allow the secular world to drive where we go and what we do with our children. And that's what's so precious about this whole program that we need to continue doing that for our children for the next generation, like you said, because that's where we're at. Yeah, and I think there's, I mean, it sounds very cliche, the whole be in the world but not of the world, right? And, and I think we do have a tendency sometimes, as faithful Catholics particularly, we want to, to kind of separate and say like, I celebrate All Saints Day not like you, <laughs> right? Or I do, I celebrate Christmas not like you. I remember my boss tells this story of, of a period of time in his, his early married life where they went to an Advent party and some beautiful singer sang Oh Holy Night and he and his wife were like scandalized because they're like, we can't sing that song yet, it's not Christmas. <laughs> um, and, and I think what has happened is he's matured in his faith and as we've matured, as like we mature, is we recognize um, that being not of the world doesn't mean like I don't I don't associate with the things that you do or or even I think an, an anger I think there can be a sense of beauty in the fact that even though our feasts people don't fully understand the fullness of what our feasts are they mark their calendar by them too right the secular calendar is marked by the feasts of the Catholic Church <laughs> it's marked by Christmas and by Easter and by All Hallows Eve and by all these other things I think. Um, like in England, they celebrate Candlemas and, and Michaelmas, and so St. Michael the Archangel. They celebrate these feasts, uh, and maybe not with a full rec recognition of what they do, but they provide an opportunity um, for us to, to really enter into the joy of celebrating with them, and then to say, like, there's more. There's something else. There's something deeper. Um, I, <laughs> the difficulty, yeah, I think it, holy cards are probably um, a, a kid that doesn't know what that is. Like, that's going to be a challenge. Um, but there is, a, a, I think, a beauty of saying, like, did you know that we actually get to celebrate Christmas two weeks longer than you? <laughs> like, did you know, like, we're actually going to keep celebrating? Um, and then there's a beauty, I think, of, like, the rest of the world's not fasting during Lent. Um, actually, I might take that back. I worked on a college campus for a, for a couple of college campuses for a long time. And our biggest mass of the year was Ash Wednesday which is the biggest non-obligatory mass for everywhere in the entire world, right? There's no obligation to go to mass on Ash Wednesday. Uh, please still go. Uh, but <laughs> there's no obligation, and it's time when people come out in droves, right? They come to mass, and they're not even Catholic. They've never been Catholic. And they think, I gotta be there, I gotta, I gotta get my ashes. <laughs> I can remember people who couldn't come to mass, and they're like, so can I still get some ashes? Um, and then there is a sense, people give up things for Lent. I, as a high school student, um, I gave up chocolate one year. I also gave up cursing one year. Um, <laughs> like, and I wasn't a Catholic. I had no sense that this meant anything. Um, but it was still transformative because we are still baptizing the culture. Even, even if the culture doesn't always recognize it, we're still inviting them into something deeper. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I don't know if that really answers the question <laughs> other than, um, yeah, I think there's a sorrow for what's lost. Um, and, and probably a desire to maintain the reverence for I, I guess I see there is kind of a current of reactionism. So in other mm -hmm. words, you know, kind of like your boss, where mm -hmm. people will pull away because they don't know what to do. Yeah. And they don't want their kids to necessarily, kids feel very pressured to be in the mainstream culture. Yeah. And so they don't know what to do, so then they pull away. Well, and like you're saying, that doesn't really work, but I get it. I get why they're trying to do it. So. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we've seen this happen in the world before. If you look at the Roman Empire, you know, um, Christianity had baptized the culture. The culture lived by Christian norms. Did they live by Christian norms? No. <laughs> uh, that's why there's still something different about saying, like, I celebrate Christmas and saying, like, 
I really celebrate the birth of Christ and I enter into the liturgical season. There's still something different about it um, that makes us somewhat unique. Um, but I think it's something to delight in, actually, that the world marks their time by our calendar. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Okay. I just want to, yeah, a couple of, I think, key ways, I think, for you to, because uh, I know Lisa has some announcements she wants to make. I think a couple of key ways for us to enter into the calendar is, is that we actually fast and we actually feast. So what do I mean by that is that we actually enter into the fast of the church as a family, right? So your family, like whatever it is that you think I need to grow in this virtue or I need to give up this thing, what is something we as a family can do together to enter into fast? Um, how do we actually um, use this season to grow in something our family really needs? So maybe our family has been fighting a lot. So maybe we turn off the TV so we can actually have conversations and give up TV for life. Um, as the kids come down and they're like, please don't make my family do that. Um, <laughs> how can we as a family fast together? And how can we feast together? So not just the great feasts of the church here, but how do we feast whenever one of our kids, their name day happens for one of their saints, right? So we celebrate birthdays with cake and with candles. Why aren't we celebrating their feast days with that? Um, their confirmation saint feast days, and their baptism anniversaries. These things in the life of a Christian are far more important. Um, well, I mean, being born is actually really important. Um, <laughs> but like, they're, they're, they're supremely important, so let's celebrate them, right? Um, how are we celebrating other saints that mean things to us? So you said, this week is actually my favorite week of the year outside of Christmas and Easter. Because um, it starts, yeah, and particularly starting for me with the archangels, that we have St. Jerome, we have St. Teresa Lucy, the guardian angels, we have St. Francis of Assisi, and then St. Maria Faustina. Vincent de Paul. Huh? Uh, Vincent de Paul, they're all in there. Yeah, and then we have one day of rest tomorrow, you guys. <laughs> one day of ordinary. Uh, so St. Teresa of Lisieux is my favorite saint. And she's not my confirmation saint. Um, St. Gianna Mola is, and I discovered St. Teresa a few months after I became Catholic. And, uh, and she, her littleness and the way that she teaches about God loving her has transformed my prayer life over the years. And I know I'm not alone because she is probably the most popular saint in the United States right now. Um, so I feel a little cliche when I say I like Therese, but <laughs> my little hipster heart is like, oh, I'm just like everyone else. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, like, I celebrate St. Therese of Lisieux every year. I celebrate her. Um, go to Mass. I, I usually buy roses. I did not buy roses yesterday. I, um, I did take my niece out to eat. She had no clue what I was talking about, but she was excited because I have a picture of Therese on my wall and she was, I like her. Um, <laughs> you know, I remember like on the Feast of St. Joseph, I took her to Mass and, and I said it was the Feast of St. Joseph and she, she doesn't know, but I showed her a picture and, and I told her Joseph, you know, he has dreams. She didn't understand that. So I told her, maybe he'll come in your dreams. I don't know. She woke up the next morning and she told her mom, Joseph came in my dream, right? So like, it's these little ways that you just get excited about the saints because they show us that it's possible to live the Christian life, right? So let's celebrate that. Let's celebrate the, the victory that has been won, that people have actually done it, <laughs> and we can do it too, and they've done it in, in so many various ways, and let's, let's enter into those celebrations. When we have a solemnity during Lent, right? So the Feast of the Annunciation and the Feast of St. Joseph, and we get to lighten up on our fast, do it, <laughs> you guys, especially if it's on a Friday and you're like, I want some cake. Um, <laughs> St. Joseph, right? He was the perfect foster father for, for Jesus, and we can celebrate that, and we should. Um, so that's, yeah, if there's nothing else, like you can do all the crafts in the world and all the songs in the world, but actually enter into the feast, right? Have an Advent calendar, or an Advent wreath on your table during Advent, and light a candle every night at dinner with your family. Make the liturgical the normal in your home. All right, I'm going to pass things over to Lisa. Unless, does anyone have any other questions? I know that I want to be attentive to you at any time. Go ahead. What were, what were you saying? What was the week we're in now? Like it's just a normal week where there's a, some, a lot of saints whose feast days are this week. Um, so August. Some of the, like, the biggest names. Yeah. Sorry, I That's okay. August 29th is the Feast of the Archangels. And that was superseded by Sunday, um, which is good. Um, <laughs> then, uh, not August, September, September 29th. September 30th is the Feast of St. Jerome, who was the translator of, of um, the Bible into the Latin. Um, and I don't, by the way, if, if you're ever a little bit grumpy, there's hope for you, because St. Jerome was a really grumpy saint. Um, <laughs> so I appreciate that we have saints that are just normal. <laughs> um, 
although he wasn't always normal, but that part was. And then Therese was yesterday. Today is the Guardian Angels, um, St. Francis of Assisi and St. Maria Faustina. Yeah, it's just, it's just a really good week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, back to you. Thank you, Jody. Yeah. Yeah.